guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Merchants of Infinity by Andrew Prowse and Rogue Artists Creations. It plays two to five players and it takes approximately, I don't know, about an hour or so to play, maybe a little more. And in the game Merchants of Infinity, you are going to be bizarre traders on the space station Mandelbrot and you're basically trying to uh, fulfill orders and requests or bonus requests or specific orders for specific types of different things that you can gather along the journey. There are 10 different types of things that you can pick up whether it be like iron or food or cloth or books or any of these other kinds of things right but everybody else in the bazaar is also trying to obtain those things you can use those things for quests or to simply turn them in based on their value in each round the values will change there's actually this little spinny thing here which will determine the value of certain things as the game goes along and you can actually kind of manipulate that if you are savvy enough to do so this is a worker placement game at its core you'll be basically playing cogs to see you who goes first which are specific cards which I'll talk about in a second here and then you're going to be basically dropping down workers one at a time going to specific locations to either gather certain types of materials or play certain actions and then after you go through a number of rounds depending on the number of players you're going to check to see whoever has the most money these credits here and if you have the most you will be declared the best merchant of infinity oh, okay let's look, let's look at the game this is the game Merchants of Infinity and everything that it comes with, or at least as far as the prototype goes. This is a prototype and do expect things to change as the game is fully made on Kickstarter. Check the link in the description and you'll see if there's any differences in what I'm explaining to probably what the game may be. Uh, this here is set up for two players roughly and it can play up to five and every single player is going to be getting a set of meeples. These are workers, they're rather large and very vibrant and you get anywhere from six to five Four, depending on the number of players in the game. You're also going to be getting three cog cards, uh, regardless of the number of players, and then an assortment of three cards from your choices of either the Vortex cards or the Orders cards. Go ahead and select them in any order you want, as many uh, in any combination that you would like as well. These you'll be using throughout the game, and you don't need to actually pick them up using your workers. You'll just start with them, which is nice. Then go ahead and shuffle both of, the, both of these decks, if you haven't already done so, and go ahead and place them down like you see here. This deck here is going to have three on this side and three on this side, and this deck here is going to have three here down below. You're also then going to go ahead and take this wheel here and place it exactly at the starting position. So it should look something like that. There's this white worker. You can place him next to the space here because people will be gathering this one. And then this is the basically the space that will block out of their spaces. So you can go ahead and set this aside right there. And then finally, go ahead and take one of these mirror cards or fractal mirror cards, flip it over and place it here. This changes the game each and every round. After you've done that, you're going to go ahead and make sure that you've got all your currency or credits set aside. And there's also going to be a token, which we'll just go ahead and use this for now, which will show the number of turns. So we have an idea of how many uh, turns we're playing, depending on the number of players in the game. Okay, so that's basically everything the game comes with, other than, of course, the mat, the rule book, and the box. How do we play it? Very, very simple. Flip over a fractal mirror card. These things will change the game in some way. Usually they'll block out certain spots on the map or give certain increases to or benefits for the different orders and or the different uh, cards that will give you the ability to gain certain things like bonuses and whatnot. After that, then you're going to determine play order by playing COGS. These are COG cards. You'll be getting them throughout the game, whether you're spending credits for them or whether you're getting one every turn, but they're going to have a value, whether it be zero or two or three, or they could even be four, as well as they have certain like special abilities as well on them. And you'll be playing them uh, after declaring how many you want to play and you're going down one at a time and the person who plays the most value is going to be the player who gets to start the game and then you'll discard the rest of them. After that, then you're going to place trader meeples into the trading spaces. You've got this area over here, which are the 10 different resources. So when you place a worker on one of these spaces, you'll get that resource. And usually these spaces are limited based on the number of players in the game. So maybe in a uh, two player game, you can have two of them here or in a three player game, you have three, just depends on the number of players here. You have the bars over here. These places will let, if you go here, you'll get in it. You can choose any one of these three cards here. You go over here, you take any one of these three cards here. Vortex bar, take any of these guys here. But these also have spatial limitations. 
This is the auction space. Any number of players can go here, but only one of each. And basically you'll be bidding on one of these extra resources at the end of the round. And it doesn't actually count towards the total player limit on this space over here, but there will be an auction phase in which you can bet credits. Over here, if you go in this space, only one player can go here. You can take this little guy here and you'll be able to use an extra meeple or extra worker throughout the game until somebody else takes this space from you. Uh, then over here uh, is going to be the mirror card uh, space where you'll be able to look at mirror cards, select them and organize them so you have a little bit of control over what those do. And then finally, you have the two specific action spaces. If you're playing a beginner game, I strongly suggest that you just go ahead and play with this side here and set aside this side, specifically if you don't like to be too aggressive in your worker placement games. This side here has a bunch of different abilities, which we'll just talk about during the review. And on this side, it's going to have a bunch of different abilities that will affect negatively other players. So basically take that abilities and beneficial abilities for yourself or potentially everybody, depending on how you look at it. Finally, you're going to go into scoring and scoring is going to be pretty simple. There is going to be the auction phase. You're then going to be able to trade in your cards here. If you get certain things like, for instance, if this guy were to have, oh, I don't know, two guys on the diamond space and you have this card in your hand after placing a meeple here to collect it, you can trade it in. You'll gather the amount of credits and you'll lose your guys here. You can also score if you have characters on specific spaces here by turning them in for their value. Value, and this is their value here. And also remember you have a limitation as to how many guys can be on each of these spaces. And you can only have a total of three different areas filled up on the board. So you could technically have it like this if you wanted, but you can't have it like that. Okay. So you can even have it like this as long as it allows three workers on there, but you can't have this. I only have three spaces. Pretty simple though. After you've scored all of that, then you're going to move the market one clockwise and like that. And you'll be able to flipping one of these guys over here. And then you're going to start all over again, playing cogs and determining who gets to go first. And you'll move the round marker as well. After it gets to a certain round, depending on the number of players, that will determine the end of the game. In which case you'll score based on whoever has the most of these babies here. And the winner is of course the person who has the most. All right, that's how you play the game. Let's talk about it. A couple caveats now before we get into it. And the first thing is these Vortex cards. These are bonus cards that will gain you value before you turn your meeples in for their resources. Now, of course, there's orders and there's also the value on this specific little chart here on based on the market and you can turn them in for either or but if you can combination with this the vortex card for instance this one here has got like a cup of tea and like a shirt if you had an order card that had the same thing on it you could turn this in first not have to turn your meeple in and get 10 points and then turn your meeples in for the order and gain that bonus which is very very useful most of the different orders are going to cost two resources and some of them three of course there are are certain ones with higher value and you those are going to be determined based on how many of the same type you need as well as how many are required on that specific card the more with the more copies is going to be the more value you can gain then you have the fractal mirror cards these ones here come out every round and i did say that they discusses how the turn how the turn changes this one it says in this world the turn order is oldest to youngest so it just changes the order of play no one may play on nova spaces so there's certain spaces you can't go on this world has no clothes so the resource clothes is no longer available and it goes on and on and on and it's just a way to change from round to round how the strategy of the game is going to is going to go. Oh. Uh, but regardless, that's pretty much it. Everything else has been discussed. Other than, of course, there's just a bunch of spaces on the board that give you certain actions. Uh, one just going to give you straight up seven currency. One will have all ship orders pay plus five for the round. Uh, one is going to have all vortex. Uh, one vortex card pays times two. So if you have a 10, like you can make it into a 20 and et cetera, et cetera. I think you get the idea on that side. And of course, on the bad guy side or the you're, you're being a little mean side uh one player loses 10 a d10 of credits uh oh speaking of which if you don't like your value at the end of a round which didn't come up all that often but let's say you had three resources like three fires and they're all worth two you could trade those resources in and roll a d10 and then based on your roll you can gain that number times the d10 
So technically you can get up to 30, but it is a gamble, but that is an option if you want. All right, let's talk about the game now. So this is a lot of fun. I really enjoy worker placement games, and this one does a very good job of it. It also adds a little bit of an auction style game to it, adds a little bit of a I don't even want to call it pressure luck, but you're dropping down. You choose how many cogs you want to play. You start dropping them down in turn in, in the previous turn order, and then whoever has the most wins. But there are little upsets and changes, and just because you have three cards in hand doesn't mean you're necessarily going to win. But it's a good way of bluffing that you're going to win, making other players maybe not want to play any cogs at all, pushing your turn order up in value. Spending scoring points to gain cogs might benefit you if you need something specific, specifically if there are a lot of players in the game. In a two-player game, I think there's just more specific where... Uh, there's, there's less need for certain things, so you won't be doing that as much. Uh, regardless, though, let's talk about the core mechanics. I love the worker placement aspect. I like all the different spaces of the board that you can go to. And I like collecting the orders and the vortex cards to make the best possible play. This game definitely has a sweet spot for three and four players because you will be placing down the meeples and it's going to be a lot more clustered. And when it's clustered, there's going to be a need for certain things and you're going to have to try and block people out as well as get your orders done that you need. And that also segues to the fact that not everybody is going to simply go ahead and keep getting that 10 resource. It's going to basically fill up rather quickly. And with more players, it will do that. Thusly, the larger value things are going to be removed Moved, and so you're going to need to find new ways of gaining resources by placing your meeples down in order to gain those cards. In a two-player game, uh, it, it works. I think it just needs maybe some tweaks or something like that because I feel like when I place my workers down to gather these order cards, I'm not getting any value for my workers, especially in mid-game. I definitely love using the cards that I already start with in the game in my hand because those are very high value. But placing workers down when worse workers are your currency makes it really challenging to want to get rid of them to gather 18 points when one meeple can grant you at least seven points. Even if, especially in a two-player game, because there's a certain number of workers that can be placed in each of the spaces, and the value is from 10 all the way to, I believe, 1 on this track here. So it's, with, with six workers, it's very likely that you're going to at least get at least six points. And if you don't fill this order, you get nothing. So you have to be very careful with that and how you want to choose to pull. I think I'd feel a little more comfortable uh, in if that, if that were the case, if each of those spaces would grant you a certain amount of credits just for going there with your meeple. Uh, the bonuses are very nice as well, but I think it's also dependent on if it's a three or four player game, because in a two player game, placing a worker there can net you anywhere from seven to 10 points, which is really good, especially if, 10, if you have 10 points and that coincides with the next value being really high in the game on the market. So if it's two fire vortex, and you place your worker down uh, and gather that uh, and gather that uh, specific vortex card and then you also place your two workers on the the fire vortex spaces which net you 10 points that can net you up to 30 points and that worker you place in the vortex area is going to give you the best possible score and there's a lot of calculations in this game when you're thinking you're like i want to get the best possible score i can for each meeple play that i put down on the board and the best possible play 10 points that's what you want to score and that number is significantly harder to get with more players in the game, which is why I really like it with, I'd say even four players is probably my favorite way to play this specific game because it allows for a lot of fighting and the spaces on the resource area get limited, forcing you to have to choose to make your, your meeples or workers value as high as you can by selecting the correct cards available to you. The uh, take that spaces eh, are fine. I'd probably play it with more competitive players but when I play this game I prefer to just play with the left hand side of the board that grants you specific bonuses that grants everybody specific bonuses and you have to choose how best are you going to manipulate that board for your favor for instance one of them will say ship orders pay plus five if your opponent has no ship orders in hand you can make that value but you have to remember you need to make at least plus five for that meeple to be worth it and if you can get plus 10 that's the best deal possible and the same can be said for vortexes paying times two one vortex pays times two if you're playing a five vortex or a seven those nets are okay provided there's nothing better you can get at eight or nine or ten in the resource pool and in a two-player game possibly can but in a higher player game much harder and definitely worth using that space just like the honest trading space gathering that set that seven currency 
Uh, I also would suggest always gather that bonus worker. Bonus workers are so useful in this game, and this one is definitely very powerful. The auction space is great. I love bidding on these spaces, and if no one goes there, you can get any resource you want for one, meaning you get a value of nine every time you go in the auction space in a two-player game when no one else does. Now, in a higher player count, that auction space starts costing you and it has to be worth it to you in order to get that resource you need because of the limited amount and the orders you need to fulfill, which changes the way the game plays. Anyway, let's talk about something else. The quality of the game is excellent. <laughs> I really think all of the cards are really well done. This is a prototype. There are certain things that are stuck on here because they've been changing the game, fitting it to mold and to perfection. The board is high quality. All the pieces are very thick, very sturdy. The workers are very nice as well. I really like these big meeples too. They're very, very nice. I don't know what they're going to use necessarily, but I like that. The credits are thick. The game felt like a retail version when I got it, when I opened it up and popping everything out. Felt really good. And so I know they're prepared to make this game, which is a nice relief as well for a lot of people that don't know when how long games are going to be taken to be made. This one is, is really close in the process, and it's very, very... It's it's right there and hitting the mark for me. I think it's like this is a game I definitely play at three and four players. Just want a little few changes to the two player rules to make it more competitive, to make me want to get those cards outside of the game. Uh, the artwork is really good as well. I like the fantasy style slash space feeling of them all. They feel like real CGI-ish kind of creatures, but they look really good. The quality, I'll, I'll pop them up here, looks really good. And it feels good to gather the specific cards and put them into your hand and utilize them. The cogs feel fun to play. You want to gather more, but you don't want to spend too much because if you spend too much, you lose it all. And it's not worth it because you don't even need to take that first player spot. And remember, you need those meeples to be worth at least seven, eight points, and 10 is the best. So every time you spend a meeple and you're not getting any value out of it, you're doing a poor job in the game and you feel it. And as you play, you get better at understanding how this works and what the value of each meeple becomes based on the number of players. I could keep going on with this game, but overall, I really enjoyed my time with Merchants of Infinity. This is definitely one I would keep in my collection. This is one that I would be able to show players who want to play a little bit of an auction game and a little bit of a worker placement game. It's light, it's quick and easy to teach, and it looks really good. If you're interested in taking a look, go ahead and go down below and pick it up on Kickstarter. Link should be in the description. The game will be coming out in a bit of time. I think I got this a little earlier than most, so this will probably be one of the first review videos out there, but it, something to look forward to if not already seeing it on the Kickstarter, if this is well into the future when the game is out. Regardless of, thank you guys for watching. Let's do the outro. All right, guys, thanks for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. If you want to take a look at this game, like I said before, down below, link in the description on Kickstarter, you can pick up this worker placement auction game with a little bit of blind bidding. It's a lot of fun, and I, if you got uh, if you got three or four players, it's what I would highly recommend. It's, it's good. I'll also go ahead and check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog post giveaways. We'll give you the game Chart of the Golden Age. I just have to have my wife put it up. It should be up by the time this video is up. And uh, I think we'll have one more as well. And I strongly recommend you watch our live streams every Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. PST. If you want to, we have a community there. We play games just like this one down there. A lot, a lot of Kickstarter games, a lot of stuff. You can see the games in action before you pick them up. So it's a good way of making you guys decide if this is for you. Thank you guys. And if you thought I did a good job explaining whether this game was for you or not for you, go ahead and hit that subscribe button followed by the, the little bell notification vacation thing you can if you want i'd greatly appreciate it shows that what i'm doing here is not all not all for not all for not 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 for not for not you know what i'm saying all right guys i'm done it's hot in here i gotta go i'll see you guys in the what is this called let me see the Mandelbrot Space Station, where I will fulfill orders, trade, and scheme, and outwit all you other merchants of infinity next time! <laughs>